Well, I don't want to uh, delay the uh, surprise announcement of uh, this year's, uh, as a joke, the surprise announcement of this year's uh, Vandewall uh, Award winner, which uh, HP will be making momentarily. Um, but I did uh, just want to uh, thank everybody uh, who's here. Um, for those of us uh, who have the pleasure, um, the award is named after our esteemed uh, former colleague, Etienne Vandewall. Etienne was a demographer, intellectual professor par excellence. He was really part of the soul of the Population Studies Center uh, back in the day. Uh, he had a uh, fascinating career in life. Um, he was uh, a Belgian colonial civil servant for many years. He got a law degree. Uh, he took up demography uh, comparatively late in life uh, and stuck to it with uh, a real order. Like I say, those of us who knew him, um, uh, he was really foundational in making the Population Studies Center here at Penn what it is today. Uh, Sam Preston always uh, talks about how ATN uh, recruited him uh, to Penn, and as we say, the rest is history. So uh, I, I do want us to go on with the present and the future, uh, but I thought I would be remiss uh, were I not, uh, for those of us who do recall him, uh, to remember at the end uh, in, in his name is, is held. And now, uh, for the surprise winner of this year's award. Okay, uh, thank you, thank you. So, the Grado Group and Demography awards every other year a prize to honor Etienne. Randival, who you know, was a prominent member of the Penn Population State, Population Studies Center, Department of Sociology, also profoundly shaped many of uh, our thinking about family, fertility, decline, gender, sexual relationships, and many of us had the joy of overlapping with him uh, in some of his But the good news is the uh, winner of um, this year's award is um, Luca Pisando, and uh, I'm grateful for the comedy, including him, Jim Park, and Daniel, Daniel Cohen for going through all the nominated papers. But they are very pleased to have Luca being this year's awardee. And Luca reflects a broad, it's a fourth year uh, student in both sociology and demography. And what is striking about Luca's development, in part reflected in his presentation here, is the breadth of growth that he's undertaken since he's here. So a lot of micro-based work um, that we're seeing here. More recently, he moved into kind of more acro, um, aggregate theory driven family change, family change work. So he's capturing a wide range of topics, and it can for sure would appreciate this intellectual breadth and interest. But without much further ado, Luca, it's up to you to talk about the independent standard impact of a cash center for education and the unpaid care in rural Morocco. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you very much. Um, I'm happy to be here today to share with you findings from, uh, from my paper, which deals with um, within household gender dynamics and gender inequality and schooling outcomes in, uh, in rural Morocco. So I would like to start just by saying that I would appreciate if you could keep more substantive comments t until the end. And I'm happy to answer any clarification questions you might have throughout. This is just because I think this might be a little dense, so it might help me to get to get to the end without rushing too much. And also I want to tell you a few words about how this paper came along. So as you can see from all the logos that are on the slides, this paper is part of a broader project which was um, funded by the Hewlett Foundation in collaboration with uh, Innovation for Poverty Action and the World Bank. And uh, it's now the, pro the project itself is now based at, um, at NYU. And um, I reported here um, a quote that I think summarizes well the whole aim behind the project itself, not, not necessarily this paper, but the project itself, and I want to read it to you. So what I want to talk shit on is the paradigm of the big idea, that once we identify the correct one, we can simply unfurl it on the entire developing world like a picnic blanket. There are villages where de-warming will be the most meaningful education project possible. There are others where free textbooks will. In other places, it will be new school buildings, more teachers, lower fees, better transport, tutors, and uniforms. The point is we don't know what works, where, or why. 
So in this all is summarized in the, in the name of the project, which is called Additional Insights, and the goal of the project itself is to just use data that have already been collected from existing randomized experiments or impact evaluation studies more generally, and try to get something out of them that is not just the main publication that usually comes out of these big randomized experiments. So there is data out there, we don't necessarily need to run lots of new randomized experiments, we can get some additional insights from the existing data from experiments that are already there. And uh, I reported here some numbers, so some that give you a sense of the big increase uh, in the number of RCTs that, that were published um, over the past 30, uh, 30 years. But what I want to stress here is that most of this growth, so the growth in the number of impact evaluation studies, occurred since 2010. So, um, and, and we know that these uh, interventions are extremely costly. So the cost of the average evaluation is around 500,000 US dollars. And the impact evaluation group at the World Bank actually estimates that this only accounts for 1.4% of the total cost of the evaluated intervention. So these interventions are extremely costly. And as data become increasingly publicly, av publicly available, so researchers and PI on these projects are now making all of the data they collect publicly available either on the World Bank platform or on the JPAL, the Poverty Action Lab platform, we should make the most of this data. And this also gets along with the ideas that have been stressed a lot in, in academia recently, so the idea of transparency and replicability. So what I'm doing here, of course, I'm not replicating findings that were already, that were already uh, documented, but just by only documenting some new findings and tying them back to the findings that were already documented by the main authors, this gives a sense of whether the, their research is transparent and replicable, and then also sheds some additional light on dimensions that might have been neglected in, in primary analysis. So the intervention that forms the object of my paper is called Taisir, which in Arabic means facilitation. Um, it, it's a cluster randomized experiment promoted by the Morocco's Ministry of Education, in to, uh, promoted in 2007, and it covers the two years from 2008 to 2010. And the aim of the intervention was to increase the rural primary school completion rate. So Taisir was introduced for this primary aim. Uh, it targets uh, school sectors, specifically 320 school sectors, then two got lost in the data collection process. And the treatment is a um, cash transfer equal to approximately 5% of the average household monthly consumption given to households with children 6 to 15. So the eligibility of the household is defined by having kids within the household that are age 6 to 15, school age children. As I mentioned, this intervention has been already evaluated and the paper of the PIs of the project has been published in the American Economic Journal, Economic Policy by Ben Assin and others. And their paper specifically focuses on um, evaluating the effectiveness of the different treatment arms. So there are four, four treatment arms one control, and one control group. And the four treatment arms are defined by a combination of whether the mother received the cash transfer or the father received the cash transfer, and also whether the cash transfer was conditional on uh, school attendance, so on children going to school, or it was unconditional. I want to stress here that uh, the non-conditional transfer was not fully uh, unconditional, that's why it's called label. And the reason is that parents to enroll their children in the cash transfer still had to go to school and talk to the headmaster. So the enrollment in Taisir happened in schools. So even if children were not in school at that time, but they were eligible because they were 6 to 15, the parents had to go to school and talk to the headmaster to enroll them in, the, to enroll them in Taisir. So this is why this ties up with the, with the educational system more generally. So parents got in touch with the school system, even those that had kids that were not in school. So um, the reason why this intervention was implemented was because in 2007, the Ministry of Education estimated that about 90% of kids enrolled in primary school but approximately 40% of these kids didn't complete the full first six years of primary education. So the dropout rate was pretty high. What I show you here is a map of Morocco, which at the time of the intervention had 16 regions. Now since 2015, it has 12. But the point that I want to make here is that um, across all regions of Morocco, the sh percentage of out-of-school children and the number of out-of-school children is pretty high across all regions. And these are DHS estimates from the latest DHS available, which is actually not that latest because it dates back to 2003. And, however, despite this being a problem throughout the country, 
this um, intervention only targeted the poorest rural municipalities in the five poorest regions of rural Morocco. So it was targeted at a geographical level. And all households with eligible children in targeted communities could receive the transfers. So, um, Benassin and, and other authors evaluated already the effectiveness of this intervention on mostly three outcomes, school enrollment, school attendance, and school performance, and as measured by some arithmetic math scores. And they found that the intervention had a strong positive and significant effects on school participation, positive but very weakly significant effects on test scores. They found that the label variant of the transfer was more effective than the conditional variant of the transfer and this became the main finding discussed in the paper because this has profound policy implication in terms of the cost of these experiments if you can get through an unconditional transfer the same effects that you would get with a conditional transfer by getting rid of all the administrative costs that are entailed by monitoring all these kids the attendance of these kids in school this has positive uh, implications for budgeting and ex experimental design and then they found no difference in targeting mothers as compared to targeting fathers. So, um, having said that, my contribution with this study is uh, threefold. First, I assess whether a cash transfer linked to education affects school progression on top of school enrollment and school attendance. And here by school progression I mean progressing through grades in a timely fashion. Uh, then I investigate whether the, the effect of the treatment on school progression, let's assume there is one, varies by the amount of time children spend on unpaid care work within the household as measured at baseline, so measured prior to intervention implementation. So here the idea is let's think about three, three different groups of children, one, one where children do a lot of unpaid work and another where they do less unpaid work. Did the intervention affect this group of children differentially because they were engaged in unpaid care work? Something along these lines, but I will explain you better how, how I operationalize this. And then I examine whether the intervention affects time spent on unpaid care work itself. So did the intervention shift the allocation of time devoted to unpaid work within the household? And I will also define very shortly what, is, what unpaid work is and how I measure unpaid work. So now the question is why does it make sense to focus on school progression and specifically why does it make sense to focus on school progression in this context? The first reason is that um, observing higher enrollment and higher attendance does not necessarily translate into learning gains and progression through grades. And this somewhat echoes the goal of the United Nations and the idea of quality education for all rather than just education for all, which is a big problem in Africa. Then, um, well, school, there is much research that identify school progression as a key determinant of subsequent educational outcomes. And this in this context makes particular sense because the study only spans a two-year intervention period. So looking at identifying children that do not progress through grades in a timely fashion within this two-year period may be sort of a harbinger of not completing primary or secondary education at a subsequent point in time that we cannot observe here. And, and this is particularly relevant to the Moroccan case be because uh, large shares of youth enroll in school, but they do not complete primary school. Also here I, I, I would like to mention that there is a, a rule in Morocco whereby in primary schools kids can only repeat maximum two grades. So after they repeat two grades, the headmaster is supposed to uh, tell the kids that he has to drop out, something, something along these lines. And the third reason is that, and this relates more to the idea of unpaid work, is that a cash transfer of this kind, which is relatively small, especially if compared to most cash transfers that have been evaluated, such as Progressa. So Progressa accounted for 20% of the average household monthly consumption. This accounts for only 5% of the average household monthly consumption. So this is much smaller than many other cash transfers. So a cash transfer of this kind may incentivize kids to stay in school, although it may not be really enough to keep them progress, to help them progress through grades in a timely fashion, especially if they have competing time demands within the household. And then why does it make sense to look at unpaid care work in Morocco? So unpaid care work is a critic is defined by is a term defined by the United Nations as a as a critical dimension of human well-being that provides services within households for other households and to community members. And here I just provided some graphs that come from some of my previous research at the OECD that, give, that uh, is based on time use surveys. 
And uh, the first graph gives you the hours per day spent on unpaid care work by men and women, and this graph only gives you the female to male ratio, so the red column over the blue column. And the point that I want to make here in across regions of the world, so the Middle East and North Africa, South Asia, Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, and so on, Eastern Europe and Central Asia. And w the point that I want to make from these graphs is that uh, in the Middle East and North Africa, is the region that has the highest female to male ratio of time spent on unpaid work. So this is of course based on time use surveys, so this is not necessarily representative of children's unpaid work because it samples all ages or at least ages 15 and above, but there is, there is actually much uh, micro-level research that shows that this female to male ratio starts increasing since very young ages in countries like Morocco or in Middle Eastern and North African countries. So and this suggests that poverty and in general um, social norms and rooted traditions might perpetuate gender inequalities which in turn affect the role that girls play within the household, the time, the time allocation of tasks which in turn may translate into differential schooling outcomes. So the paper combines three different strands of the literature. The first one is the one that, I've, that I uh, assess is the impact of interventions on, school, pro on uh, school participation outcomes. And here my claim is that up until now, very few impact evaluation studies are concerned with uh, assessing whether a cash transfer affects school progression. And this is because it's typically much harder to affect outcomes such as school progression or learning outcomes rather than just attendance on, or enrollment. And, and then the second stream of the literature, which is much, very much related to the work of the United Nations, is the one on unpaid care work. And my, here I claim that there is still a very little research at the micro level that shows gender imbalances in unpaid work, or in time spent on unpaid work by children. And most studies that relate uh, paid work, so child labor in general, and schooling outcome focuses on paid labor and school participation, rather than unpaid labor and school progression. And the third stream of the literature is the one that looks uh, at the heterogeneity of impact of cash transfer interventions, which ties back uh, very well with the whole purpose of the project itself, of additional insights. So um, I'm using publicly available secondary data. I think also for students here, these data are available for many other interventions, and they're, I think they are, it's very nice to use them. Uh, four types of data were collected, a school sample, a household sample, a test sample, and some surveys that were meant to assess whether parents and teachers understood the, how the conditionality and the unconditionality worked. But for this paper, I'm mostly using the household sample, so the baseline survey and the endline survey, where the baseline was conducted prior to intervention implement, prior to randomization and prior to intervention implementation. Uh, the randomization was implemented at the school sector level. The school sector is defined as one primary school plus three or four satellite units, though data collection only happened in two schools, so the primary school and one randomly sampled, uh, randomly selected satellite unit among the three or four satellite units. Randomization is stratified by region, school size and dropout rate, and Importantly, here in my paper, I'm not making any distinction between the conditional cash transfer and the label cash transfer. The reason is twofold. First of all, that this is the kind of discussion that happens already in the first paper, and uh, is very central to the whole discussion and the whole findings. But more importantly, the authors find that at least until the end of the first year, or first year and a half, more than 50% of parents did, or, did not really get the difference between the label and the conditional aspects. So, uh, of course, I ran analysis also using these two treatment arms. They didn't show anything special, so I decided to pull the sample size, just cash transfer versus no cash transfer. This summarizes experimental design. It was targeted at the school sector level, 318 school sectors. The shaded boxes are, the, are my treatment arms, so the control group made of 59 school sectors and the treatment group made of 259 school sectors, while the white ones were the ones that were evaluated previously. So households uh, were sampled from school registers, specifically for each school unit, two lists were drawn, one list in which uh, at, ha, that samples households with at least one child enrolled in school at the time, so at based on it in 2008, and another list of households with no child currently enrolled, but at least one child enrolled in the previous three years. And six households were selected from the first list and two households from the second list. So overall, eight households were selected from two different lists based on school registers. 
the, um, the program take up was pretty much full, so 90% of households had at least one child enrolled in the program by the end of year two. And we have an average of two children per household who receive the transfer. This is, here I also need to mention that if a household had more than three kids and uh, they were eligible, so six to 15, they could not receive the transfer, all of them. The maximum was three, no more than three. And um, so children are the main units of my analysis. I identify 10,889 children, six to 15 at baseline, though about 9% of the baseline sample dropped out between baseline and, uh, and follow up and end line leaving us with a post-attrition sample of 9,938 children. And to make sure that this, that this attrition does not yield imbalances in baseline characteristics, which is what we care about in a randomized design, this table, which is sorry, maybe a little small, but it's the smallest so far, then the others will be bigger. This shows, um, first of all, descriptive statistics of all of the variables collected at baseline or most variables that we are interested in, but also it shows whether these variables collected at baseline were balanced between the control group and the treatment group which is what we need for a randomized design to, to make sense. And um, specifically, the first column is the mean of the variable in the control group, while the column number two is a coefficient that comes from a regression of the left-hand side variable on a dummy for treatment. So this is basically a t-test for the difference in means, accounting for the sampling design, the straight randomization dummies, and whatever is important to preserve the, the effectiveness of the randomization. But this shows us that more or less uh, all character most characteristics were balanced at baseline, except for uh, some that pertain to the share of children enrolled or not enrolled in school. So the share of never enrolled kids was a little higher in the control group, and conversely, the share of enrolled kids was a little higher in the treatment group. It was 0.76 in the control group and about 0.80 in the treatment group. This is some 76 plus this. So, to make sure that these differences at baseline do not drive the results that we will observe in, in whatever I estimate after this, I will control for these baseline characteristics. And also importantly from this table, the, the, vari the variable on, oh sorry, the variable on unpaid care work is balanced at baseline, which is what we need because I'm using this variable as a as an heterogeneity or moderator variable interacted with the treatment. So the precondition is that at least this variable it needs to be balanced at baseline. So in terms of unpaid work, I measure it through time use surveys. Time use diaries were collected uh, for all children 6 to 15. And uh, the caregiver is supposed to report the primary and the secondary activity that each child performs within each 30 minutes slot of a day which is the day preceding the survey. And among all of the activities that the caregiver reported, I selected 10 that are identified in the literature as being part of unpaid care work. And I will show, you, I will show them to you in the next table. And now the challenge is how to, how to deal with this 30 minute slot. So the first option in the literature is to attribute the whole 30 minute slot to the activity that the caregiver reported as the primary activity. The second option is instead to attribute 20 minutes to the activity that the caregiver listed as primary and 20 minutes to the activity that the caregiver reported as secondary. This is a little more common in the literature and makes more sense because it allows for some simultaneity of tasks, which is what happens in all of our lives. So I'm using in the paper uh, this second measure, though just keep in mind that these two are correlated 0 0.95, so both of them are pretty much representative of what's going on. Then I add up all of the 30 minute time slots in which the child performs one of these activities and I obtain a measure of minutes or hours per day spent on unpaid care work. In most of the summary statistics I use minutes, minutes per day, in most of the estimation I use hours per day due to the size of the coefficient to allow for a better interpretation. So this table shows some descriptives on unpaid care work over for the overall sample or for boys and girls separately. And it also shows you which, which are the 10 activities that I included as unpaid care work. And uh, it also, so the first 10 entries are the 10 activities and the last entry is the overall unpaid care work variable, which tells you the total minutes per day spent on unpaid care work by boys and girls and on the overall sample.
So what this shows you is that, well, gender imbalances are pretty much striking across all of the activities, especially if we focus on the combined variable. So on the unpaid care work variable, we have that boys spend on average 17, 18 minutes on unpaid care work per day, and girls spend on average 17, 76 minutes on unpaid care work per day. But I need to tell you here that, of course, there are lots of kids that don't do any unpaid care work. So there are lots of zeros that drive most of these estimates down artificially. So what I show you next is the participation in unpaid care work. So the share of children engaged in unpaid care work, the share of boys and the share of girls. And what this shows you is that across all of the activities, girls' participation is much higher. Across most of these activities is much higher, such as these are all acronyms, but this is preparing food for a meal, food for another occasion, housework, washing clothes, other domestic activities, shopping for the house, and so on. So across most of these activities, girls' participation is higher, specifically for doing housework. The only activity for which the share of boys engaged in unpaid work is a little higher is shopping for the house which somewhat aligns with the idea that in some of these countries there, are, there might be some restrictions to freedom of movement for girls, though he, he here the difference is very, very small. And what I would like you to keep in mind is the last, is the last two bars. So overall, we we, I see that about 77% of boys don't do any unpaid work, and 50% of girls don't do any unpaid work. These two graphs gives you some additional descriptive statistics on unpaid care work. The first one gives you the, the minutes per day spent on unpaid care work by boys and girls by number of siblings in the household. And the second one gives you the number of minutes per day spent on unpaid care work by the age of the child. So what the first graph tells you is that the real difference is between having no siblings or having, having at least one sibling. Once you have at least one sibling, the amount of time per day spent on unpaid care work is pretty much similar for both boys and girls. And the second graph instead tells you that for boys, the unpaid care work doesn't really vary much with age. It stays around 18 to 20 minutes per day. And for girls, instead, it increasing sharp, is increasing sharply with age to about 160 minutes per day. Um, moving to the school measures, I here conceptualize two ideas. So the first one is the, idea of ex the extensive margin of school participation, which means being in school versus not being in school. And here the outcome is a dummy that equal one, equals one if the kid was in school at baseline but dropped out between baseline and follow up. Instead, the other conceptualization is the one of intensive margin of school participation. So the idea of progressing through grades on time, conditional on remaining in school throughout the period. And for this idea, I use an outcome that I call timely grade progression between 2008 and 2010, which is measured, it's a dummy as well, it's measured as, uh, it equals one if the kid progressed two grades over two years. So he was fully on time, or two or more grades. There are a few kids that progress more than two grades over two years, but very few. So if the ch a kid progressed fully on time, he's coded as one. If the kid progressed at a suboptimal pace, he's coded as zero. Now here the challenge is what to do with the people that dropped out, so, uh, which I will discuss afterwards. I will show you a first set of estimates and then I will show you how I improve on this set of estimates. Uh, I estimate linear probability models uh, where the CT stands for the intervention, for the treatment, the cash transfer given to any parent. And the X is a vector of straight Adam is child level controls, household level, school level controls. And here I just wanna stress that this unpaid care, baseline unpaid care work all also enters the, the vector of controls because I'm, I'm including the interaction in the estimation. So it needs to also feature as a variable itself in the X vector. Um, Given that households with dropout children were, were oversampled, I'm using household weights, and most of the analysis that I show, at least here, are stratified by gender, but I have all of the pooled estimations in case you are interested. So starting from the extensive margin of school participation, this is a dummy that equals one if the kid was in school at baseline and dropped out in between, so in the two years. This table shows us the effect of the transfer on dropout, and we see that the transfer was very effective in reducing dropout for both boys and girls. So it decreased dropout for boys by about 4.7 percentage points, and it, in, it decreased dropout for girls by about 7.2 percentage points. Now this percentage points coefficients need to be evaluated on the baseline for the control group. So this 
after we do this, we, uh, I show that the decrease in dropout, the dropout decreased by about 41% for boys and 42% for girls. So very similar decrease in dropout for boys and girls. And the pool estimates that are not shown here show that the two coefficients, 0.47 and 0.72, are not statistically different by gender. I think also what is interesting for this, from this table is the fact that unpaid work turns out as being a slightly stronger, predict, stronger predictor of dropout for boys rather than for girls. And, I, and this goes back to the idea that I mentioned before, that unpaid work, at least for girls, is so much of an ingrained part of their daily lives that it might not be so high as to prevent them from going to school whatsoever. It instead might be more relevant for other types of outcomes, like progressing on times or learning outcomes. And instead here, this shows you the same set of estimates on the timely grade progression dummy, excluding the people that drop out. So this doesn't have the dropouts here. And this shows that the, the treatment, so the cash transfer, was not, did, did nothing to boys' timely grade progression. It, is, it instead uh, increased girls' timely grade progression by about 7.2 percentage points, which again, translated in percent terms, is an increase of about 11 percent. And also what this shows is that, well, unpaid work turns out as being a stronger predictor of girls' timely grade progression, but also, and this uh, somewhat goes back to my second research question, this shows that the, treatment, that the benefit of the treatment was actually cut almost by half for girls that are engaged in an additional hour of unpaid work. So the variable that I'm using here, unpaid care work is continuous, so this is assessing a continuous treatment effect, which is more in line with what the literature does. But what I, what I will show you next is also how this varies if we conceptualize a um, 0, 1, 2 variable, where 0 stands for not doing any unpaid care work, doing zero two hours a day or doing more than two hours a day. So what this graph shows is that for, this is just for girls, and here I, it's the uh, adjusted proportion of girls that progress through grades on time. So this shows you that for the a group of girls that don't do any unpaid work, the treatment was very effective. Uh, so the timely grade prog progression is higher, but actually for the other two groups, uh, this was not really the case. These two are not statistically different. These are not statistically different either. But the, the differential benefit of the treatment that we observed before is in the difference between this bar and this bar here, which I also reported here. Treatment, no work. Treatment, high work. This difference was very significant. So this is telling us that the treatment is affecting girls' grade progression, but it's affecting it much less for girls who are engaged in unpaid work at baseline, as of baseline data. Now, moving back to the, to the problem that I mentioned before, here we only observe grade progression for kids who remain in school throughout the observation period. So kids that do not drop out are very likely to be a non-random sample of all the kids in school at baseline. And if this is the case, excluding these people makes the OLS estimates biased and inconsistent. So to sort of correct these estimates, I use three different strategies. The first one is a, is a bounding strategy where what I'm doing is to give an extreme value to grade progression for the 716 kids who dropped out. So let's assume that instead of dropping out, this kid would have progressed perfectly. Or let's assume that instead of dropping out, these kids would have not progressed at all. Which probably the second one seems a little more reasonable than the first one, but we, 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 can, we can never know. The second strategy is, uh, is just to uh, get a sense of whether attrition is random or not random using this Becchetti gold lillard welch test. And if that is the case, using some sort of inverse probability weighting by reweighting the sample of the people that remain in school, so the non-attritors, by the inverse probability of the attritors. This is a strategy that is very commonly done in, in, uh, in research, though still it suffers from the from the fact that it's, it just accounts for selection on observable characteristics. So you reweight the sample based on observable characteristics. And then as a third strategy, I implement a two-step Heckman correction, which is meant to correct for uh, selection on unobservables. So what I, what I show you here, these are the timely grade progression estimates, coding the, peop, coding the kids that drop out as one. So let's assume this kid progressed, progressed perfectly. And here instead we assume that these kids did not, did not progress at all. So in a sense, the, the top panel uh, could be seen as a 
lower bound of the effect, the bottom panel could be seen as a, an upper bound of the effect. As I said before, it's probably more likely to believe that instead of if they had stayed in school, the people that dropped out probably would have not have progressed as well as the people who progressed timely. But this gives sort of a confidence that the, esti that the estimates that I showed you before are pretty much meaningful. Because what we observe, at least for the first set of estimates, is that well, this effect of the treatment also for girls decreases both in magnitude and significance, but this differential treatment effect for girls and pay, engaged in unpaid work still holds. Um, and what we see instead from the bottom uh, panel is that for girls, the set of estimates remains pretty much the same, but for boys, we, we start observing this positive effect on timely grade progression. But remember that given that we're coding these people as zero, this picks up a lot of what I showed you before on the dropout estimates, which were very strongly significant also for boys. And uh, the only difference that we observe is in the differential impact of the treatment for the girls who work, because here the, the benefit of the treatment in, is cut by about half, and here instead is cut by about one third. So, uh, Moving to the second strategy here, the idea of this test for attrition is to predict an outcome at baseline, so regress an outcome at baseline, in this case being in school at baseline or remaining in school, on a set of predetermined variables, a dummy for attrition, so for whether the child will drop out afterwards, and the, the interaction of all of these baseline variables with the attrition dummy. Then you run an F-test on the attrition dummy and on all of this interaction of the attrition dummy with the, con with the X's. And if you reject uh, the null hypothesis that the attrition is random, you might think that the attrition could not be, could not be random. So uh, this suggests that you need to do something on these estimates to, to capture the fact that attrition is not random. And the typical strategy is to apply inverse probability weights. So where the the idea behind the inverse probability weights is to give more weight to children whose characteristics are more similar to those of children who drop out. So you run the estimates on the restricted sample, but you give more weight to the children whose characteristics are more similar to the children who end up dropping out. And here I also provided a, a kind of a summary table to show you which factors are more strongly predictive of dropout for boys and girls. So these are the variables that then enter the computation of the inverse probability weights. And as mentioned before, unpaid work emerges as a stronger predictor for boys. And some other variables related to, in a broad sense, to unpaid work turn out as being slightly, a slightly stronger predictor for boys rather than for girls. But age, age is, mo is, is actually the strongest predictor of dropout for both boys and girls. So this is a set of estimates taking into account this inverse probability weight, so reweighting the estimates based on the probability of attrition. And this shows you, well, again, for girls not much happens. Again, the, the benefit of the treatment is cut by about one third. While instead for boys, it remains non-significant, but some of, the, some of the coefficient change sign, and this is due to the fact that we're giving more weights to some boys that have characteristics more similar to those that drop out. But bottom line, these estimates are again consistent with my main finding, that there is a, an impact of the transfer on girls' timely grade progression, though this impact can, can be a different impact based on whether the girl is engaged in work or she's not engaged in work. And then this is, this is the, these are the estimates from the Heckman selection model. Here, you can always find a way to, critica to criticize these approaches. Uh, the, the, the message here is that you need to find a variable that pretty much affects your selection equation, which, be, which means being in school or remaining in school, but it shouldn't really affect your timely grade progression. So we could think in a theoretical sense that the distance between the school and the household could affect whether you end up going to school or not, so your access to school, but once you are in school, it might not really affect the extent to which you progress through school or not. So it might be more of a barrier for being in school versus not being in school, rather than being a predictor of whether you progress through school once you are already in school. And here the idea, the idea is to estimate a selection equation, get this inverse Mills ratio that then you plug into the second stage equation, this lambda here, if this inverse Miller's ratio is significant, it suggests that there is selection on unobservables. If this is not significant, it suggests there is no selection on unobservables. Uh, so based on the variables that I'm using as the identifying variables, which are here the distance between the household and the school and the time for traveling around trip to school, 
This estimate suggests there is no selection on unobservables, and pretty much the set of results that I obtain are similar to the, the ones that I've been showing to you throughout. Now, moving to the third research question, which is whether the transfer itself affected the time allocation and unpaid care work within the household. To do this, given that I have estimates of unpaid work both at baseline and at end line, and I have a treatment and a control group, I use a very simple uh, diff in diff specification where the variable that tells us whether the treatment is effective is the interaction between the dummy for time and the dummy for treatment, which is highlighted here in blue for boys and in red for girls. And what this is showing us is that the intervention had no effect whatsoever on the allocation of time spent on unpaid work for both boys and girls. I think what is interesting that comes from the first coefficient, the one on time, is that um, time spent on unpaid work over this two-year period increased uh, for girls by about 30 minutes, 31 minutes. This is in hours, but I'm interpreting it in minutes. And, uh, and instead for boys, it decreased by about two minutes. And this is even after controlling for age. So this all controls for age. So con moving to a summary of the conclusions, the, the answer to my first research question, which is whether a cash transfer affects school progression on top of enrollment and attendance, is yes, it does. It does through variation at both the extensive margin by stemming dropout equally for both uh, boys and girls. And it does at the intensive margin by increasing timely grade progression only for girls. Then, does the effect of the intervention on school progression work differently for children performing versus not performing unpaid care work? And I find that the effect of the intervention on dropouts operates equally for children engaged in unpaid care work versus not. But once we move to the timely grade progression estimates, the beneficial effect of the treatment on timely grade progression is cut by about a third to a half for girls who report being engaged in unpaid care work at baseline. And then does the cash transfer intervention affect the allocation of time? I find that no, it has no effect whatsoever. So now what, what is this all, what is this telling us? So how, how is it possible that um, this cash transfer affected dropouts similarly for, for boys and girls and instead it impacted uh, timely grade progression differentially for boys and girls? So I tried to think about a series of mechanisms that could account for these findings. The first and most obvious is typically test scores. Test scores are in most contexts, including Morocco, a strong predictor of whether you end up repeating a grade or not. They are not the only predictor, but they are a strong predictor. And here, well, Benassin and others find very weak effects on the transfer on endline scores, as I mentioned. And I, I, I did an analysis that is similar to their, to their one, and I find myself that the transfer had very little impact. If anything, it was slightly more effective on boys learning outcomes. So this clearly cannot explain uh, why we are observing what we are observing. There are some um, potential other explanations here that these are only math test scores. They were, and, and they were only, well, and we know that uh, typically test, at least girls perform better in, in, in uh, exams that are not necessarily math. So this could be something to take into account. If we had data on other type of test scores, we could take them into account and see if girls are doing better in those tests. Then the, the test scores were only collected for one randomly sampled child. So the sample size is much smaller for these estimates. This could also, this could also explain why we're seeing very marginal or very, very weak effects. Even though finding very weak effects on learning outcomes is typical of most of these cash transfer interventions that are better in affecting participation and school participation and school attendance, absenteeism, and much less good in affecting uh, learn, learning. Then the second mechanism is time spent on unpaid care work. Well, I've just shown you through the diff in diff that time spent on unpaid work didn't change at all. So I tried to think about potentially other, other mechanisms. So time spent on, for instance, time spent on homework. Maybe we see that girls ended up progressing better as a result of the treatment because they ended up spending more time on homework at home or something like, which could predict also great repetition, great retention, great repetition. And here I put this weird sign because explanation 3 and explanation 4 account for some of the story, but don't really account for the whole story. So the two together might tell us something, might be behind what we are observing. 
but none of them individually can explain what we are observing. Because for the time spent on homework, I observed that as a result of the cash transfer, the time spent on homework increases more for girls, but I don't observe any differences between by based on unpaid work. So it might explain the differential effect we see on girls or, uh, rather than boys, but it cannot explain the differential impact within girls for the working groups, for, for the fact that one group works more than the other. Then the, um, the absenteeism suggests that a result of, as a result of the treatment, absenteeism actually decreased for both boys and girls. So this is what is conflicting with the finding on, grade repeti on timely grade progression. But at the same time, instead here I see some differential impacts by whether the girl was working ex ante or not. So this could account for the second portion of the explanation. And then another type of mechanism that I explore here and this was something that was inspired by the main paper, which mentions towards the end that there was a change in the perceived returns to girls' education. I actually ended up testing if that was the case. And I find that for girls, the cash transfer led to large po positive changes in perceived returns to education, which I will show you here. So given that the cash transfer was not fully unconditional, was somewhat labeled, and the families got in touch with the school system, um, it's as if parents revise their expectation upwards for girls' education. And this is shown, so parents updated, their up, updated upwards their beliefs about the value of education. And this is shown you in this table, which has to be read in this way. So this is the effect of the transfer on the probability of being employed once adult for a boy who does not complete primary education, or for a boy who completes primary education, and so on. And similar for girls. And what we see is that for boys, there, there was no impact whatsoever on this uh, probability. This is parents' probability. This is all on parents. So parents' probability of being employed once adult. And instead for girls, there are, um, there are some effects towards, for girls, if a girl is expected to complete junior high school or high school. And what I see also here doing this, this analysis differentially, this is a little more challenging because this is at the household level, it's not at the individual level. So instead of using baseline unpaid work of the child, I need to create an index for whether in the household the amount of unpaid work spent by children is high, medium, or, or low. And what we see here is that uh, this impact is actually very high in the treated group if in the household the average amount of time spent on unpaid work by girls was very low. But instead, if in the household, the average amount of time spent on unpaid work was very high, this differential impact of the treatment is pretty much cut to zero. So uh, to kind of wrap up everything, my findings show that uh, as a result of the, tra the cash transfer, girls engaged in unpaid work were ended up staying in school more rather than dropping out, but were not really progressing through grades at a pace comparable to girls who were instead not engaged in unpaid work. And this tells us that uh, whenever we think about designing interventions, especially on this kind of outcomes, we need to think about interventions that help all children attend and progress uh, through grades in a timely fashion, not just some specific groups of children. So in this case, in my work, this group of girls specifically engaged in a high burden of unpaid work turned out as being a particularly vu uh, vulnerable group. And, and this in turn suggests that, there, that these interventions need to better take into account the need to, take, to tackle gender inequalities within the house. Households. And, and then as unpaid work also turns out as being a negative predictor, at least of timely grade progression, but the cash transfer itself didn't shift at all the distribution of unpaid care work. These types of interventions need to take into account also more the mechanisms whereby we end up observing differential educational outcomes. And unpaid care work could be one of these mechanisms. It doesn't turn out to be one in this work, but it could be one of these mechanisms. So the bottom line of all of this is that reevaluating existing programs may enlighten previously neglected aspects, may also shed more light on some outcomes that on which the transfer had less impact. This is something that uh, typically people, of course, don't like to publish or find hard to publish if you don't find any effects on some of the outcomes. But uh, the, whole, the whole message behind this paper and the engagement in the project itself is that uh, getting a better sense of why a program works, for whom it works, and under what conditions can shed better light on um, policy evaluation and policy design. Okay, thank you.
how little boys help in unpaid work. And so I may even be naive what you know rural Morocco looks like, but is it the driven that um, kind of the categories they collect are maybe very gendered categories and they somehow missed out help that yeah, it could be. I actually compared the time use survey in this in this uh, data set with other time use surveys to get a sense of whether this was the case. It didn't turn out to be. I think most of the categories that are typically included as unpaid work was, were also included here. So um, the data don't confirm what you're saying, but there might still be that if they had collected more categories, probably. Could, I, could you document where the time comes from that you know the kids need to go to school? So I you know, so I guess unpaid work was not affected by the, in, by the incentives and thus increased school enrollment, but something ought to go down, like the soccer play or something. Anyway, the time must off the increased school enrollment must come from somewhere, and there's a consistency test. It would be nice if you could actually show that anyway, they're giving up something and you rule out unpaid work, but, you know, it's leisure or paid work or something ought to be going down. Yeah, actually the measurement of leisure is instead a little diff is not that good in this data set. But, and I think that's where probably some of the story comes in. But uh, yeah, I can get a better sense of the use of time in other categories that are not neither unpaid work or schooling. Thank you, that was uh, really interesting. Um, my question is about the uh, interpreting the effect itself mm -hmm. uh, as either sort of like a causal estimate of like these girls who, to begin with, they are already doing a lot of work. Uh, they might have more incompatibilities in the education, so therefore, like, it doesn't make much of an effect. Or well, the alternative interpretation, which is their, their, the amount of health work that they are doing is an indication of the type of family that they are working yeah. in, and the sort of that value that is attached to their education. Or their yeah, yeah, yeah. Advice. So, no, so, sorry. Yeah, so I'm inclined that uh, there might be something to the first one, but I think that there might be a lot to the second one as well. Yeah. And I was just thinking whether you have enough cases of within um, comparing signals within the same household. So the idea would be that you could have um, girls who don't do a lot of housework, but some of her sisters are doing a lot of housework. So is the effect of the price transfer uh, really about who does the housework or really about the kind of family that you're in? Yeah, so I agree with you. This is a problem I think is probably the biggest problem I still haven't figured out how to, to, to get around. And uh, for two reasons. The first one is that this time use module was only collected for the eligible children. So I don't have a lot of variation of their other siblings. Or I don't have the time, the time use module for their siblings. But otherwise that would have been a good option. Um, and I, I, I think that Probably the story lies more instead in the second option that you that you laid out, and that has to do with the fact that unpaid work might be endogenous itself. It reflects the fact that parents observe the cognitive endowments of the children, and as a response, they send a more talented skill to school, and so on. I I try to to get better estimates potentially, and and the way to do that would be to have some IVs for unpaid work. So so predict some predict unpaid work based on some potentially exogenous characteristics and then use the predicted uh, unpaid work as a moderator of the treatment. I, f I thought I found variables that made sense, and I think they do make sense, but whenever I run the first stage results is too weak, so it, the estimates go everywhere. So I'm stating this, actually I think I'm stating it here. I'm stating it here as a, an important limitation mm -hmm. that unpaid care work might be endogenous itself. It seems, at least so far, this was not one of the issues that reviewers picked up, so they weren't very concerned about this. But, but potentially, the way to do this correctly would be to, to get a better sense of what predicts some paid care work itself. And I find from, the, from the, some of the analysis that I do that some household composition variables clearly affect this. So I managed to compute the ratio of older sisters over older brothers. Well, actually, it's the ratio of children between 16 and 18, so children not eligible, sister over brothers, and that has a strong effect on, on predicting, strong uh, predictive power on empirical work. And also, I have some variables on the access to piped water, access to well, um, access to uh, having a sewing machine within the household, so all of these kind of variables that potentially, and, and they predict strongly 
they predict strongly unpaid work, but then once you insert them in the second stage, accounting for all the straight randomization dummies and everything, their predictive power kind of fades and the estimates end up going in very strange directions because the first stage doesn't hold. So yeah, but I think the story is more in the second, uh, in the second that given the parents exam already know that some girls are more talented than others, they end up investing the cash transfer differentially on the girls that are instead more talented. You didn't talk at all about paid work, do the children? Yeah, paid work? no. And would it be that the girls, when they get the money, they let the girls give up the paid work and let them go to school? Yeah, they, no. The reason why I didn't talk about paid work is that children in this sample, only 2% of children report being engaged in paid work. So there is no variability whatsoever in paid work. So it's not a substitution? No, it's not a substitution with paid work, even if there might be an underreporting of paid work. Yeah. My question is um, a little bit more about how you think about this type of work. I, just, I think it's great to use these type of data sets and exploit uh, RCTs that have already been done. But I find it tricky to think about looking at this type of outcome where the original study probably wasn't powered to detect effects on these other types of outcomes. And then you also, the more people who do this and the more we investigate these types of things, you get into a problem of uh, multiple testing with you know one RCT exposure and then looking at many downstream effects. And so what have you done here to sort of think about <laughs> that? And then how do you think more broadly in this type of work yeah. about that problem? Well, that was actually the tricky part of this. This started as a fellowship and Sharon was part of this fellowship. So she helped me figure out a little bit how to go around this. Uh, but. Uh, it's hard whenever you end up reading these published papers that have tons of analysis, tons of robustness checks to get a sense, but they actually our task was to find something on that data. I was assigned this data set, I didn't pick it myself. Mm -hmm. so, it's, so it's hard. That was the, the complicated part to figure out a research question that might uh, make sense, that might explain some of the things that the authors don't explain. And, and I think the way I, I immediately had this idea of looking at grade pro, uh, school progression, grade progression, because that was never mentioned in the paper, and, and, and I ended up also sending emails to the authors of the paper, and I asked if that was because there were any problems with those collection of those data, and the answer was not, it just didn't happen. So I ended up focusing on grade progression, and I did some power tests, some some power analysis and it seemed that that was still detectable, the minimum, minimal effect was detectable. So I said, well, let's try with that. And then the unpaid work, actually the main authors talk a little bit about the use of time. They don't fully conceptualize unpaid work the way that I do it myself, but towards the end they show how the day of the child changed a little bit. And um, though I thought that there could have, given that I did some basic estimates of the gender differences in unpaid work and I saw they were striking, I thought maybe they could there might be something more in, within this, uh, this time use data and unpaid work that can explain some of the differential outcomes. So it was a long process. The, for the beginning was, was a very long process. Yeah, so I don't know. Well, I just, I think it's a great question. And just, I guess to follow up on it, because this was not part of the original study, I think of this kind of work as more like hypothesis generating to then be able to be tested in future work rather than confirming a hypothesis, but I guess, can you talk a little bit about it? Do you think of this as more of a, a way to understand more about this program or a way to generate new hypotheses for future research to test in a more confirmatory framework? Yeah, no, I thought that the focus on school progression was actually something that could add to this work itself. Then uh, the type of uh, heterogeneity or moderation analysis by unpaid work, I think is something, especially in context in which you, you might predict unpaid work in an exogenous way that could be potentially extended to many other studies. But not just unpaid work, many other, poten many other variables that potentially explain differential impacts across groups. So I would say it was a combination between the two things. I also would say that at first when I started this project I was a little scared because I, well, I used to be in the econ world at some point and I know that these kind of analyses are a trick. I mean, they're hard to convey, uh, people don't really see a uh, great value in using this data again to discover something else. But actually my experience has been positive on that sense, for, from reviewers, from people, also at conferences, everyone found this idea of using 
data from existing randomized evaluation as the main contribution of this. Then they see many, some problems, of course, that I'm gradually dealing with, but I think the whole idea was well taken. Yeah. I keep thinking back to um, the age patterns of care work for girls versus boys, and how you show that for boys it remains relatively stable across childhood, but for girls you see sort of these rapid rises with age. And whether or not you looked at sort of age variation in terms of the impacts of the cash transfer, like does the, the, does the age of the child matter, particularly for girls, or does it say anything about if we're thinking about policy impacts, when in a child's life course, these sorts of impacts, we might derive sort of the most benefit for the for the cash transfer program. Like, does investment in sort of early childhood uh, sort of reduce girls' unpaid care work in any sort of way? Does it increase their does it increase their chances of progressing through school? Sort of, what do you, what do you have to say about life course variation? Yeah, no, I haven't looked at differential impacts of the transfer by age. I think, first of all, because these kids are, are age 6 to 15, the sample size is not huge, so it's not easy to detect meaningful impacts. Uh, age by age, there is no way to do that. And creating age categories, yeah, can be a little discretional, but you could create, I don't know, 6 to 8, 8 to 10. But even there, the sample size would be probably too small in this case. But I think it's a point that maybe it's worth at least, uh, I agree that it's an important point and it's maybe worth discussing a little bit in the paper, at least in the theoretical framework. Because, yeah, yeah, thanks. Just out of curiosity, do you know if any, like, I just remember the progress of um, cash, um, I guess, policy in Mexico. I don't know if you know of any, yeah, related findings, because it was also sought to increase school attendance. No, I, I checked that and I think there is a new paper coming out that compares four or five cash transfer interventions including Progressa and including this. Mm -hmm. And one of the claims was that in Progressa they typically don't give a lot of importance to unpaid work. So they have a whole discussion of paid work in Progressa mm -hmm. and uh, how, how unpaid work may matter in like, moderating some of the impacts, but they don't have anything on, on unpaid work as of now at least. Mm -hmm. So I don't have a clear way of comparing my findings to their findings, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.